afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Vivek Sudhi. I'm an autism activist and an advocate for autism awareness and inclusion of special needs in the mainstream. The session you're going to witness now is going to be about diagnosis of rare diseases. And it's my honor to introduce the moderator for the session, Dr. Christina Skrutnik, consultant medical geneticist, genetics, and inherited disorders at Jawara Center for Molecular Medicine. Assistant Professor of Molecular Medicine, Arabian Gulf University, and University of Medical Clinics, Chair Rare Diseases Campaign and Care for Rare Support Group, Kingdom of Dr. Please come. and 
and also providing important information for, for the patient, the family, and uh, so the team for management. So, then we've done this in the past. So, we've already added, let's say, the first layer of biochemical testing uh, integrated in the genetic test. So, the, the, the first omics to be added to genomics is biochemical testing or metabolomics, if, if you wish. And we've done that first as a pilot for Bush's disease, then <coughs> some formative. Then uh, we've integrated this uh, approach also in the ways and the uh, offers um, because we think that that will provide additional information that in fact does provide additional information um, and increase the diagnostic here. Uh, 
that was, let's say, the main concern to know how um, degradable RNA is and, and how unstable it is. So, we've done some comparison with, uh, let's say, the gold standard or blood collected in, in oxygen tubes. And what we found is when we compare first it comes uh, data from um, the genes with the, the, the dry blood spots with the, the results of blood, so the same sample, the same patient, sorry. What we uh, find out is that it's not, it's not that different. In fact, it's, the correlation is extremely good, as you can see there in the, in the middle. And the, the expression profile, so the genes that are expressed in blood, you can put them up in a very similar manner, manner to what we do with the uh, whole blood in, in vaccine tubes. So that was, let's say, it was a surprise. And okay, uh, let's let's move on. Let's let's do uh, what can we extract from from, from here. So of course, we can evaluate uh, the expression of each of you. We can look at splicing impact. We can even go uh, further and uh, check the expression pattern of, of a specific gene, if it's overexpressed or underexpressed. And we can uh, even do some pathway analysis um, if we get uh, um, sufficient information from that. And the thought process here was okay, now. Let's, we know that the quality of the data is there. So, what shall we do first to validate the, the strategy? So, let's look at variants that we know are pathogenic. Um, and we start focusing on splicing variants. <coughs> so, let's look at variants that we know are pathogenic or like pathogenic. And let's see if the RNA result can corroborate. Uh, that fact. So, first case is um, a seven year old uh, male patient with uh, intellectual disability, seizure disorder, um, CNS malformations, um, motor delay. So, single case exam, as far as we know. Um, there was a suspicion of neurometabolic disorder and um, co exome sequencing detected um, an intronic condition. So if you look, it's a very deep intronic, very, uh, quite deep intronic uh, deletion uh, of 24 <laughs> base pairs, not near the, the, the usual splice site. And uh, but because it was already uh, described by other patients, segregation uh, match, etc., it's clearly well-known variant classified as like a package. Right? So um, let's use this as a positive control. So what did the RNA data show us? So if you look at the, the, the two tracks in the middle, so in the bottom we have the sonic structure, this gene, um, and to focus on the highlighted uh, exon, and the two tracks in the middle show controls. Right? You see uh, it's a normal expression and uh, splicing of that exon there. And if you look at the index, the, the exon is not there, so there is uh, exon skipping. So it's simply not there. And the splicing goes directly from uh, Exon uh, 8 to exon 10. And this is absolutely clear, I think, for even for those that are not used to session reports, it's pretty evident. So this was a, a good sign. So let's look at another example. This is a two year old female that uh, had a velvet uh, delay um, and, and visual deficit. There was, there was, a, there, there was, or there is, an uh, affected uncle, and um, it's a suspicious neurotabolic disorder, and we detected uh, NBC1 homozygous variant. Here, uh, 
here in the canonical spice site, so a plus one, and it was classified as likely pathogenic. And um, so the question is a human taxi um, diagnosis here. Um, but if you look at the RNA data, once again, so the same uh, structure on the bottom, the, the, the gene structure of, the, of this region, two controls, and then the index case, you can clearly see that part of the intron is retained in this transcript. It's, it's uh, um, evident that it's not that the normal splice process is not um, uh, here is is disrupted. What we did next was look at other variants that were classified not as likely pathogenic or pathogenic, but as as a US or very unknown significant how would this method of impact classification, could we um, take information that will allow us to upgrade classification to like pathogenic or pathogenic? That was the answer we were looking for. So for this case, um, it's a three-year-old uh, female um, with a intellectual disability, regression, seizure disorder, and uh, some even uh, peripheral uh, nervous system Normalities and visual impairment, uh, and if I can see it, the time in, in infancy. And we detected in, in the exome a homozygous intronic division from plus three to plus six position, once again, not including the canonical spice site um, in the exit gene. And we knew that we already performed in the, in the same, this was a Mofiamis um, case, that the, the, the the activity of beta hexosamine based A was pathologically increased. So, very suggestive that this variant, although still removed because of the location, uh, if it was not this variant, it was something in this gene. And um, we could perhaps confirm that uh, this was the, uh, the culprit. So here the structure of the sesame pods is a little bit different because we also have the parents. So let me focus your attention to the, to the bottom image. Once again, the, the last track is the, the gene structure. Then you have the three exons expressed there. Then the second, uh, the two in the middle are the, the mother and the father, so the parents that are exozygous. And you can see a hint there that the expression is not as high, right? It's half, more or less, right? And then it's very clear in the index that that exon is not expressed at all. It's skipped. And um, although, once again, it's not a canonical spice site, it has an impact on spice, clearly. Then is another uh, patient. Uh, suspected of with Scott Auger syndrome and with an uh, hemicytous um, intronic parent. Once again, not with the canonical spice site, so plus five. And if we look here, the, 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 the control, exit age is present in both and it's uh, not there in, in the index. Another boost that is that was upgraded to um, black health check, confirming the, the diagnosis. Then we have this, uh, so this is more of a late onset neurological disorder, generalized dystonia, tremor, no CNS abnormality, no family history as well. And in the exome, we detected um, an exosic symphonic variant. In this gene, that is uh, really, really new, and it's in the plus one position for uh, several reasons. It's classified as, as a VOS, but transcriptomic data here uh, was able to provide us because we were expecting it could be exoskeleton, but it's not. In fact, it's intron retention. As you can see, all the intron between these two exons is retained. 
heterozygous, as you can see, so only about half the leads contain the, the intro, and the, other, uh, the others are, are normal, once again, supporting the, the pathogenicity of this, of this variant. And finally, this uh, um, case is also a, um, a very young male patient uh, with a suspected dysmorphic syndrome with intellectual disability and neurodevelopmental disorder. And in the genome, um, we detected um, an intronic, once again, non canonical, so plus 5, in, in KPM 5C. Um, and we tested the mother, and it was the novel, that because of the position not sufficient to uh, confirm its pathogenicity, still classified as, as a duplex. Looked at the transcriptomic data, and once again, here we have intrant detection, retention, and also normal splicing. I think it's uh, rather um, visual to, to see that, in fact, the, the splicing is intact. And there are new guidelines to classify non coding variants. We also use them with this, uh, with this data. And um, we really do things that having this new layer of teonics is going to be very helpful to clarify the pathogenicity of these of this, um, non coding variants. So, this is what I'd say to my, my uh, final message is that we are really convinced. Transcriptomics uh, can add value, can add diagnostic uh, yield, and also help us clarify the pathogenicity of, of, of the variants that we find in, in patients with, with brain disorders. Thank you. Clinical text. Right? 
So there's no point in having a list of VOSs in genes that make no sense to that patient. Right? So um, we only report, irrespective of the, the classification of what we are not doing that, but irrespective of the classification, we only report VOSs that at least have the potential to explain the, the, the phenotype. So that the requesting physician can look at them, um, review the phenotype, review the patient, think of this could be it, or no, 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 this is so uh, not matching, that's probably nothing. And then pursue other tests, for example, segregation analysis, etc. Um, and of course, if we have in house any tool that could help us go even beyond and then reclassify the variant, we will. Oh. 